Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We're delighted to welcome you to the fifth in our series of Zoom meetings arranged by Liberal Voice for Women. We're a special interest group of Liberal Democrat members and supporters aiming to promote the interests of women and girls within our party. We're focusing in these meetings upon topics which we feel the Liberal Democrats need to understand and discuss openly. We're not convinced that our party's current policies are always in the interests of girls and women. Tonight, we're fortunate to host a speaker whose work is central to any discussion of the competing rights of transgender people and women and girls. Can I ask you to put your questions in the chat as we go along, and I'll call on you to ask Kathleen at the end. Please bear in mind that we're recording this event and we'll be sharing the recording on YouTube afterwards. So please indicate when you write your question, whether you'd like to ask it yourself or prefer that I read it out for you. May I suggest that you put your Zoom screen on speaker view, active speaker, uh, which I'm doing now, and uh, uh, that will give you the best choice, the uh, best view of the discussion. Now you can relax with your, your favorite snacks and help yourself to a beverage of your choice. Let me introduce you now to our speaker. Kathleen Stock has had a stellar academic career, going from school in Montrose to Oxford to study French and philosophy, then to St Andrews to study philosophy for a master's and on to Leeds, where she took a PhD. Dr Stock has taught at Lancaster and East Anglia universities before appointment at Sussex and she's been a, a, a professor there for the past three years. She's currently Vice President of the British Society of Aesthetics, has written a monograph on Only Imagine, Fiction, Interpretation and Imagination, and in January was awarded an OBA to Services to Higher Education. Dr Stock, Kathleen, your book is wonderfully accessible. <clears throat> Thank you. To readers who don't have a background in philosophy and want a clear guide to understanding what gender ideology is supposed to be about and why it's a danger to the interests of women and girls and anyone who believes in material reality. Right at the start in chapter one, you give us four axioms of gender identity theory, eight moments which take us from Simone de Beauvoir to the explosion of identities and four different meanings of gender. Do you want to expand on this at all? Gosh, um, well, I can expand on the different meanings of gender. Um, uh, so gender is this very mysterious word. Uh, I think it's mysterious and it's certainly mysterious to people I talk to. And in fact, it has, it's multiply ambiguous. So it means different things in different contexts. And quite often when you have two people really furiously arguing about gender, they are arguing about different things. So they're talking past each other. So um, one uh, meaning of gender is just a polite word for sex, but meaning biological sex, male, whether you're male or female. So your gender in that sense is whether you're male or female and there's nothing complicated about it. I think people have tended to adopt it um, when they don't like to say the word sex because they think it's impolite because of course the word biological sex also has two meanings, as, well the word sex has two meanings as well and um, we're all familiar with the other one. So polite word for sex is one meaning. And then um, you've got the, the meaning that really emerged in the 70s, 60s and 70s of the last century, which is gender understood as the social meanings around sex. Uh, what's culturally um, defined as masculine or feminine behaviors, uh, appearances, uh, psychological characteristics or whatever you want to put in there and there's a big argument going on another argument going on about whether that's nature or nurture you know whether there's a real uh, sort of essential masculine or feminine uh, role associated with sex but we can leave that aside the point is it's it's the kind of masculinity or femininity so that's number two uh, number three is a quite uh Sort of academic use of the word gender. Some academics have used, start, have started to use the word gender in a way that 
is not to do with biological sex anymore, but means womanhood or manhood. So they're saying that um, womanhood is, is itself something social and not biological, and so is manhood. And that's a, a move that was made, and I try and go through the reasons for that move in the book, but it was made by feminists in an attempt to avoid what they call biological determinism, the idea that we're kind of biologically programmed to have certain roles and they wanted to get away with that. So they thought it was a handy, a nifty trick to redefine womanhood and manhood in a way that didn't include biology and then we couldn't be biologically determined. And I, I have some strong criticisms of that as a, as a philosophical move. Anyway, the final, the final notion of gender is gender identity. And this is the idea which we come across all the time in popular culture at the moment, that you have this inner feeling or sense of gender, your, your identity as a female or as a male or as neither, which can come apart from the actual facts about you biologically. So you can be, um, as they say, assigned female at birth, but you might have a male gender identity or you might have a non-binary gender identity, which means you don't identify as either male or female. And really why I wrote this book is because gender identity is in the ascendancy culturally and in law and policy. So we are now told that it's your gender identity, not your sex, that determines your rights around spaces, resources, um, and other issues too, sport being an obvious one. So, um, so those are the four senses of gender. And, and, and like I say, they're very different actually, but they um, are not disambiguated by contemporary activists in this area. Yes, and so there's a lot of confusion, isn't there, between the various different senses in which people use these, these terms? I think so, yes. I think it increases the toxicity, which is already quite intense around this area, if people are literally talking past each other. So I actually try <laughs> never to use the word gender. So in the book, I just, I, I, I will talk about gender identity as the thing that I'm crit sort of critically scrutinizing, but I don't say gender meaning masculinity or femininity. And, I, and when I say, when I mean sex, I say sex. <laughs> That's really helpful. Um, and, and you give us four axioms about gender identity theory, which, which um, a lot of them <laughs> have no, uh, no notion of. Yeah, well, I didn't know you were gonna ask me this, so I'm quickly gonna leaf through my own book, remind oh. myself. <laughs> right, so they are. Uh, these axioms, these are sort of things that I think are taken for granted by modern trans activism, trans activism being organizations like Stonewall in the UK and in the US, GLAD, um, HRC, ACLU and things like that. Anyway, the axioms are you and I and everyone else, everyone listening has <laughs> this important inner state called a gender identity. And for some people, as I've already just said, your gender identity fails to match your biological sex, or they might say you're the sex assigned to you at birth, and these are trans people. Gender identity, not biological sex, is what makes you a man or a woman or neither. And the existence of trans people with these mismatching gender identities generates a moral obligation on all of us to recognize and legally to protect gender identity, not sex. So hence the move towards um, changing our spaces to make them self ID basically. And this whole move towards self ID in legislation, policy, um, sport and so on. But if we, if, if many of us, mo I would say most of us don't have a concept of gender identity, mm -hmm. then, uh, and this gender identity is unknowable without uh, an inquiry, um, whereas biological sex is a clear and patent measure of uh, who people are. Mm -hmm. um, why, why, uh, why do we focus on that and not what I would see as the obvious biological sex? Well, indeed. I mean, <laughs> I don't have a justification for that because I think it's uh, profoundly stupid to focus on gender identity. Um, and I agree with you that not everyone has a gender identity. I mean, the, the whole concept of gender identity is defined in terms of a strong feeling. Now, if you don't have that feeling, I mean, there can't be feelings you have that you don't feel. <laughs> so if you don't have it, you don't have it. Um, 
in the in the book, I do spend a chapter to kind of going through different theories of gender identity and saying, I think there is a sense in which some people have a gender identity that doesn't match their sex. It's a kind of um, sort of strong identif mental identification with an ideal of maleness or femaleness or am androgyny. And I think we can take that seriously. So that I'm not going to ridicule the idea of gender identity, but we put like that, but we don't all have one. So that's one problem in making it a fundamental determinant of rights. And the other problem, as you've just also mentioned, is you can't see it <laughs> or perceive it uh, in the sensible world at all. We're, we're constantly told that your gender identity is something only you can know directly. No one can tell you what it is. No one can detect it necessarily from the way you dress, how you, the surgery you have in your body, the way you present. So the gender identity is supposed to be separate from gender expression, from behavioral expression, from sex, from surgery, from hormones, artificial or natural. So it's got nothing to do with that. It's supposed to be this sort of almost a cult kind of inner core sometimes it's talked about, but yet that is supposed to be the thing that determines our entry into women only spaces or sports <laughs> teams. Now that's never going to work. It's completely unsustainable, illiberal and all the rest of it. So I can't go into um, detail, <laughs> some detail yeah. about all the problems of that. Indeed, indeed. Uh, and and uh, following on to that in, in, in chapter two, you, you, your account of the importance of biological sex gives us three rational accounts, three alternative accounts of what biological sex is and how it works. And um, how have gender theorists managed to convince people that it's sex that, are, that it is a social construct and gender that's real? Well, they've done it um, partly through calling upon academics um, who have argued that sex is in some sense not real or not kosher or not um, the sort of thing that we should be making policies about. So partly I, I, I've had to, um, I wanted to engage with the kind of intellectual background on this because I think it is doing a lot of work in um, you know, seeming to justify some quite absurd conclusions. And one of the strains here, there's many intellectual strands sort of converging at the same time as well as cultural strands and all the rest of it. But one of them is a kind of, um, post-structuralist social constructionism about um, science, but also sex in particular. So the idea is that sex is, now we're talking about biology. <laughs> I have to keep being clear, I'm not talking about the sexual act yet. Um, biology is constructed through discourse. So there's nothing pre-existing or material there before humans started thinking about it and conceptualizing it in language. Um, it's not a view I agree with, um, but it is a strong presence in some quarters of the humanities. So that's one um, kind of strand. And then another strand, which I also talk about is uh, what I would call the instrumentalization of people with um, disorders of sexual development, um, who are colloquially known as intersex, although a lot of them are absolutely nowhere near intersex. Um, so philosophers have tended frequently to say, oh, look, there's, there's some people who, who don't clearly fit into one category or another. That shows there are no categories or the categories are constructed. So there's a really quick move there, which I also criticize <laughs> on a number of grounds. So, um, so that's, I think those are two of the background moves that on the face of it look like they have a quite a lot of authority they're sort of quasi-technical they improve they impress quite a lot of people I think um, they sound deep as well you know reality is is socially constructed that sounds really cool to a lot of people <laughs> but it's having these sort of detrimental consequences specifically for women and girls you know if those are those are views that should ramify out to all of us but strangely enough <laughs> it's women and girls that are feeling the pinch so I think that's yes. to be scrutinised too. And, and uh, you give us also uh, four clear and unambiguous ways in which biological sex is important in, uh, in chapter three. And I love your warning that the heavier role biology seems to play in a given difference, the more strongly will advocates of gender identity theory seek to suppress special mention of it. That's a, that's a killer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, I noticed that. Um... I mean, it is quite striking, isn't it, that there are areas of 
what we have taken to be completely uncontroversial sort of biological difference like men on average can throw things faster and harder than women and are stronger and quicker and heavier on average than women and yet they are being denied um or that there are medical differences you know or you know there's all there's just sort of blindingly obvious features of reality that are being bizarrely questioned so I thought well I'll just take the most obvious ones um and re reaffirm the you know that their existence you know in ways that hopefully meet trans activist objections so that's what I try to do in that chapter so I start with medicine you know sex makes a difference to medicine and all sorts of ways like not from the drugs that you should be on to the doses that you should have to the pain thresholds you have you know um, to the diseases you have and the prognosis you have and or are likely to have um i also then talk about sport and it makes huge differences and i talk about um sexual orientation because sexual orientation is the attraction of one members of one sex to another sex and trans activism wants to deny that too and say that what we're really attracted to is inner gender identities you know i'm a lesbian i'm attract i'm a female attracted to females i'm not attracted to males no matter how they identify and and it doesn't make you a lesbian if you're a male with a female gender identity attracted to females and yet this is what we're being told so sex makes a difference sexual orientation and then the last one is um the differences that sex makes to relationships between men and women um, and most obviously given the size disparity on average the strength disparity on average and the sexual interest on average of males to females this makes a huge difference to sexual violence against women um, and makes it more likely for women and from men so we lose the words to describe any of this if we lose the words to describe sex and yet this is what is being we're told we're being told we should do to be kind and, uh, and why is it that um governments institutions the civil service and so many uh authoritative bodies seem to have sucked this up and uh and, and swallowed it that's a good question too um i mean sometimes some days i just can't believe it. So in a way, I don't I don't have the complete answer. There's something psychological. There's many interesting things going on about how this has happened, but a pretty practical, you know, a, a sort of concrete answer is that they have been, um, they have been, they most you know a huge number of our national institutions are signed up to uh, Stonewall, and Stonewall since 2015 has been churning out propaganda and I call it that absolutely without any uh, exaggeration um, propaganda in favor of changing the laws um, towards gender identity and away from sex and so if you're a stonewall diversity scheme if you're in sorry if you're in the stonewall diversity champion scheme as most government departments were and some still are uh, local councils, police forces, universities, education, uh, you know, some schools, some um, local councils in charge of schools, and so on, NHS bodies, it's, it's just everywhere, then for about five years, um, the, the equality, diversity and, rep, what do you call it? equality, diversity and inclusion departments of these organisations will be churning out, you know, on every trans day of visibility or uh ida hobbit day which is international day of something for uh, anti uh, anti homophobia biphobia and transphobia you know there's, there's a lot of days they sort of function like uh holy days in the calendar <laughs> <laughs> but um you have to observe them you have to have your rituals associated with them and you have to put out on all comms lots of information about how trans people are suffering and they need self-id as a solution to their suffering which is totally on evidence like what the connection is supposed to be but that's what we're being told so and people just think they're being nice and they think it they also think it's something to do with gay people because Stonewall have bundled up LGBT and said it's all the same which does not allow room to disambiguate the interests of a lesbian who's same-sex attracted from a 
a heterosexual trans woman who's still married to his wife, her wife. So um, it's not the same. And yet we're being told it's the same. And I think if you're straight, you possibly just accept what you're told. And so I guess that's part of the story. So it's, it's ignorance. It's, it's much, much of the time, it's uh, something that's passed us by because we're not involved in any of the activities, let's say, or any of the I think that's right. communities. I think that's right. And because it's, it is dressed up in terms of propaganda, you know, you may have seen a ITV programme called Butterfly about a trans child, you know, and it's, it's presented as a kind of amazing redemption narrative or some kind of metamorphosis that was, that's nothing but, but joyful. Of course, it's not talking about the effects of puberty blockers on young bodies or the fact that the child might desist in future and then have lost sexual function. You know, there's a whole range of complex ethical stuff that is being absolutely shoved under the carpet and this beautiful rainbow gloss Yes, it all feels great and sounds great. And if people don't want to look too closely into it, I'm sure they think it's wonderful. And it's the same with seahorses and that sort of thing as well, isn't it? It's it's kind of mythical. Well, there's, I mean, that's not my area, but um, I know some psychoanalysts who are, you know, talk about the kind of archetypal imagery in some of this. Yeah, the mythical. Um, and and the, the question of gender identity and how it's formed and how it's uh, maintained. Can you give us some more information about that? Well, and I mean, as the model that we get from, um, from contemporary trans activism and some academics is that it's this sort of inner state you have that kind of, as, as I've said, only you can know about, it's in you somewhere already. And if you don't know about it yet, it'll at some point it'll sort of burst out your chest as it were, and and you'll, you'll know it and then once you know it you can't suppress it and it would be a liberal to try and get you to suppress this inner thing that's part of you so it's a sort of quite a concrete imagery um and it's permanent you know it's um so there's no unless it's fluid but then there is this <laughs> extra category which is gender fluidity but that's a sort of permanent version as well <laughs> um everything's being sort of parceled out into more and more and more identities as it were but whatever identity it is that's yours and it's you it's who you are it's a fundamental part of you and all the rest of it now i don't agree with that model at all i think it's a as i say to have a, a gender identity is to have a sort of psychological identification with an ideal of maleness or fem femaleness or androgyny if you're non-binary and that's something that's happened to you you didn't choose it you know you don't choose to psychologically identify with who you identify and identification is a very normal um, psychological process people identify with football teams or um, pop stars or uh, feminism <laughs> you know <laughs> Amazon, it's partly you know informs how you see yourself you see yourself as like the thing you're identified with and then but you want to be more like it and you can find community and solidarity through identification. So that's all great, but it's not a permanent essential fact about you that couldn't be changed. It depends on your context and how you interpret yourself. So it can be fluid. And, um, you know, so, I mean, I'm clear throughout the book that this is not in any way a critique of trans people, adult trans people who've decided to transition socially or medically. That's not my concern. Um, my concern is well a number of concerns one is about the law and the policy thing and then this stuff about gender being uh, gender identity being fluid is relevant to children so yes. that's where it becomes exceptionally important to know that when a child says i'm you know a female child says i'm a boy that's not a permanent sort of sign of something bursting forth from them that you must immediately affirm <laughs> It's a, it's a self-interpretation which could be confused or temporary or playful or whatever, but you wouldn't be medicating a child on the basis of it, I think, and shouldn't be. And so yet... That's not what's happening. Yeah, and yet that's, that is happening. And, and you talk, when you, in that chapter about gender identity, um, you talk about detransitioners, we're never really trans in the first place, it's sometimes said. But if identities are fundamentally attached to personal meaning making, and if meaning making can change over an individual's life, this can't be right. So 
if they identify as trans, they go through medical or surgical or both changes to their bodies, not just social transition. How can they not be trans? Well, I mean, the de definition of trans is up for discussion, right? I mean, that's, that's a philosophical question. What is trans? And um, actually, I say you shouldn't really identify, uh, sorry, you shouldn't really define being trans in terms of having a non-standard gender identity, because I think actually quite a lot of butch lesbians, for instance, have um, masculine gender identities without being trans. So um, detransitioners are people who thought that they, you know, were trans or they identify, had a strong gender identity with the opposite sex, um, identification with the opposite sex, and thought that they were somehow the opposite sex in some sense um, until they didn't, until they got a different sort of interpretation of the world and the, their place in it. They might have despised their bodies. They might have been self-harming teenagers. You know, there's a very big uptick in girls in particular going through um, gender identity disorders. So there's a lot of background explanations that might have explained this. Autism is a predisposing factor. Sexual abuse is a predisposing factor. Being gay is a predisposing factor because you might be interpreting your sexual attraction as meaning you're a straight boy in a girl's yeah. body yeah. rather than a gay woman. <laughs> so there's a lot of stuff being, you know, maps being formed in adolescence and um, detransitioners form them one way and then later they form them another way. But for some of them, there are physical uh, after effects. Consequences, yes. And, and, and of course, when they're coming to this conclusion, uh, the detransitioners, they, they are, they're, they're more mature anyway than they were when they decided that they were transgender in the first place. So I can I see that there are, there are real issues there, aren't there? And, and the emphasis on affirming always mm -hmm. um, uh, a gender identity and not trying to find, as you say, uh, the underlying causes or comorbidities that might be involved Mm -hmm. um, isn't that a danger? I would say so. Um, I mean, this notion of affirmation, again, is pushed heavily by Stonewall <laughs> in this country and in, um, by trans activist organisations internationally. So they have, um, I think, quite cynically uh, hooked onto the discussion of conversion therapy, which was originally about people trying to convert homosexual people into heterosexuality and which could be done very traumatically in religious contexts or other contexts. Um, so people, most people in the UK, I think, don't think conversion therapy for gay people is a good thing, especially not when it's coercive. And building on that, then um, these organizations have, have slipped in the idea that you shouldn't practice conversion therapy on sexual orientation or gender identity problem being what they count as then conversion therapy on gender identity is talking to an adolescence about their feelings of being trapped in the wrong body like talking therapies maybe gently critically exploring whether it might be something else <laughs> you know that or maybe your gender identity has a certain your strong affinity with the male has other roots that's all off the table um you know and there's a move that it's been criminalized in canada for instance so um and in the uk um there's this thing called the memorandum of understanding understanding which was against you know set itself against conversion therapy for sexual orientation and gender identity. And it's been signed by professional organizations like the British Psychological Association. And I think, although I can't remember off the top of my head, but I think a professional, probably the Royal College of Psychiatrists or something like that, you can check. But I just think this is absolutely crazy. And again, it must be because people don't understand or know about it. Professionals do not really fully understand or know about it because you cannot be um, outlawing talking therapy for potentially confused children when and adolescents when there's a possibility of them taking drugs that will 
alter their bodies irrevocably and change their sexual function. Yeah. So it, it's just clear what to me what the ethical issues are. And I can only conclude that people, professionals don't yet fully understand them, which is partly why I write this, wrote this book. I'm trying to get people to see what's at stake. Indeed. And, and the idea that this is outgrown uh, talking therapies for gender identity uh, mismatch. Whereas a generation ago, um, anorexia was the thing. And that you know, we didn't affirm anorexics, did we? Well, no. I mean, there was plenty of, um, you know, stuff on the internet about what could you call pro anna uh, websites which were kind of affirming of your inner self-image but um professionals didn't do it no uh, so i mean there's there's just huge parallels there i think between um anorexia and uh, gender identity disorders and actually quite often i mean there is again a sort of connection like there's comorbidity um that some well at least anecdotally some of the detransitions i know were anorexic Yes. So um, we, we need to see this through a self-harm lens. I'm not saying it's like that for everyone, but it's potentially like that. It's quite obviously potentially an act of self-harm to bind your breast, to want to cut them off, to, um, you know, want to hide your body and to feel disgust about it. And uh, self-harm trends change from generation to generation. Kids tend to take what tools they're being given by the culture at the time. I've said this in a few interviews now, but you know, as a as a lecturer, there was a time when, especially in the summer, girls would come into my classes and they'd have cuts all the way up their arms, and it, it was quite frequent. I have a lot of kids from North London coming to North London independent girls' schools coming to Sussex, and as you know, it was obvious that cutting was a trend at that point. And I think we should ask what whether what the trend is now. With respect to breast binding and um, taking microdosing testosterone and things like that. Yes, um, you you looked conceptually at woman, the, the category woman, and you dealt really thoroughly with the conceptual analysis of of uh, the terms woman and man. Um, and you you are clear that trans women are not women like adult human females are women, and similarly with trans men, uh, it's not quite as catchy as trans women are women though, is it? to say that well no it's not catchy and trans women are women being catchy is one of part of its sort of mantra like hypnotic appeal but um yeah i mean in that this is the this is what they call the witch question which i've had fired at me by mps at the women and the quality um parliamentary select committee when i was giving evidence there out of the blue someone says to me you know do you think trans women are women and i've had it said to me and no because they all they think you're going to say oh uh <laughs> you know it's a terrible confrontational thing to have to say i'm afraid i don't <laughs> i've thought about it i've thought about what the category woman does i think it is a very useful category we couldn't do without it we're a sexually dimorphic species we need concepts woman and man uh to and given the role that sex plays in social life woman is the adult human version of the female and man is the adult human version of the male and we need concepts for those and they're not you know the entry conditions it's not like letting you into a club <laughs> it's it's not about being nice it's about those categories doing the work they need to do to explain the world we live in having said that i am happy to go along so i have a chapter which perhaps you'll get to about fiction i'm happy to go along with the fiction that trans women are women in certain contexts interpersonally if it helps um, I will, and that's not a problem. You know, I mean, we get involved in fictions all the time, benignly, but I will not be compelled <laughs> to engage in a fiction that I think is, you know, at an institutional level, which it now extends to like have not being allowed to use sex based pronouns in court, even when you're giving evidence about your own rapist. <laughs> I will, you know, so there are limits to the fiction. I think that's entirely reasonable. Um, and your chapter six, Immersed in Fiction, that's a really interesting way of addressing the legal fiction bestowed by the Gender Recognition Act. And I think uh, if we say that it's a legal fiction, it's not that we're trying to erase transgender people. We're recognising that, that, like a corporation, this is a way of enabling somebody to take a different category. Yeah. 
than the one that they would normally be um, be used to. Yeah, um, I mean, I'm not, and you're certainly not raising trans people because they exist. They clearly exist, and I've no ambitions to argue against the gender re uh, gender recognition act as it is. I mean, I've, I've ambitions to argue against proposed changes to it in favour of gender identity. And I've no ambitions whatsoever. And in fact, I would be very critical of attempts to uh, to change the Equality Act, which protects gender reassignment. So that's all fine. And that's got nothing to do with what we're talking about, because, you, you know, the, gen the Equality Act doesn't depend on trans women literally being women to protect trans women. Yes. Um, you talk about gaming as well. Now, that seems to me to be a useful way of, of, of viewing gender alternative roles. And trying things out, I suppose, if you're if you're an adolescent, is that it? Well, I think um, we being immersed in a fiction is something most of us do at least once a day, whether it's a novel or a TV show or gaming. Kids game a lot, uh, and you know you lose yourself in a world imaginatively, and you really do. For that period, you're not aware that it's not real. You know you. Sort of, you're in some sense aware, like you don't completely lose the plot. You uh, you still know, you know where the rooms in your house are, <laughs> or like as I said in the theatre, you still know where the loos are. But you know you lose yourself in a fiction. And the thing about fiction is that when you're lost in it, you don't want anyone to draw attention to the fact it's a fiction because that ruins your immersion. So that partly explains, I think, why there's a lot of suppression, speech suppression around this. But there's nothing wrong with it, and. There's nothing wrong with it intrinsically. What I do say in that chapter is that like gaming, there are like sort of intense gaming for hours and hours and hours a day. There are downsides personally. You can lose the sense of self. You can um, lose contact with reality in ways that are detrimental to you. So I think the analogy is quite good. Um, also being online all day, being on, the inter being on Twitter all day or Tumblr or Facebook, curating a, an image of yourself which you have total control over and getting a lot of validation from it from your peers yeah you know that's yes. not it's not really the same as moving through the physical world where you can't control how people see you and that is a fact so, <laughs> go out and have a walk is uh, it's yeah get, exactly that. i would say that yeah. <laughs> get out into the, into nature <laughs> yeah um but the, that internet gaming disorder that was a new one on me and that, that that's um that, that sparked a, a, a kind of frisson really that that could well be a, an issue if, if you've got youngsters who are keen on gaming. Oh yeah, you can get lost in all sorts of things online, sort of pathologically gaming, pornography. <laughs> it's another, another sort of interesting connection that the more porn young people are watching, the less contact they're having with um, real encounters, real social encounters, and also the more extreme their fantasy worlds are becoming. Yeah. Um, so there's a bit about in the book about the connections between objectification and some of these sort of very sexualized versions of trans women. I was just going to come to that. You've got a powerful account on page 231 for those who are listening. Mm -hmm. um, it's a really great book. Get a copy quickly if it happens already. Um, about uh, your, uh, not a tirade, but a, an account against objectification, which is really, really powerful. Chapter seven, how do we get here? the propaganda that you've mentioned yes Misuse, suicide stats objectification yes i mean that's lots of different things in that chapter and but i just the on objectification is something i've written about independently in philosophy um in my academic writing and i do think that we underestimate the effects of the rampant scale on which women's bodies are objectified it influences how women and girls see themselves it certainly influences how men see them. And um, I think that has its role to play in this discussion as well. Um, your, your final chapter, uh, it, it actually it came too soon almost. It's a, a really brilliant book. And I think it's going to be a vade mecum for lots of us. You know, when we're trying to counteract some of the specious arguments that we come across, we'll go, oh yeah, I know what that is. <laughs> and we'll be able to go to your book and go, that's the one. <laughs> and you know, I, I can see that we're going to be able to use your book as a as a counter to lots of the. Well, I, hope um, so. I hope so. Um, uh, chapter eight: Better activism in future. It, your your first paragraph there is succinct and really powerful about rejecting gender identity theory theory, 
Um, trans people are trans people. We should get over it. They deserve to be safe, to be visible throughout society without shame or stigma. Uh, and, and to have exactly the life opportunities non-trans people do. There's no, you know, there's no way that can be seen as anything anti-trans in any way, by, by any means. And that's what most people I know yeah. say as well. Yeah. And, and they're entirely reasonable. Um, but um, what trans people don't deserve is to be publicly misrepresented in philosophical terms that make no sense. Do you want to expand a little bit on that? Well, I mean, it's just a continuation of the critique of gender identity theory throughout the book, which actually I find um, quite a lot of trans people really didn't ask for and don't want. So yes. that's another aspect of this that, you know, trans activists are taking a very narrow view. Many of them are not trans themselves as well, but they're taking a very narrow view of what the rights of trans people must depend on. So it must be that you recognize this inner state in order to have rights. Um, they don't agree, and especially older transsexuals, people who have, um, transsexual being the sort of term for people who've gone through surgical reconstruction and hormonal intervention. And they don't think you can just become a man or a woman because of how you feel inside. They think, that, um, I mean, I don't agree with them about this, but they think you become a man or woman through going through some intense physical intervention. Now I don't agree with them, but it wouldn't, you know, that's, that's not to say that they don't deserve everything I just described, but um, I just think uh, this whole move towards gender identity theory is not in the services of trans people, young or old, you know, so they're a demographic that we need to consider as well. And also a lot of them have, um, don't want to be active about it. They don't want to, sorry, they don't want to be active politically. They don't want to be open. Some people, some trans people haven't really let people around them know that they're trans. Mm. Um, so they don't, but they, I do get emails. I got one last week in fact, um, from a 72 year old transsexual <laughs> who said, um, I never asked for this and I agree with you. Would it surprise you to know that I agree with you? <laughs> <She said. laughs> yeah, there's a, there's a cadre, isn't there, of people who, who are rational and know that they are still the sex they were born. Yeah, they wouldn't be trans if they had literally, you know, if they, if they weren't, didn't start off the sex, you know. They, precisely, precisely. Um, and you talk about the emperor's new dress, which is an interesting uh, notion, isn't it? Mm. Well, the emperor's new dress is my um, slightly <laughs> facetious comic way of, of describing a phenomenon that I have encountered uh, where a trans woman, it doesn't really seem to work in the opposite way for trans men as much, but trans, and there's something to be asked about why, but mm -hmm. a trans woman um, suddenly becomes keynote speaker at, you know, so the one example was Monroe Bogdorf being keynote speaker at the, I think it was the BFI, British Film Institute, you know, women in film uh, conference, having made no films, not even a filmmaker, <laughs> you know, but suddenly, um, right at the front of the stage. Another case in my own discipline was um, uh, a trans woman who transitioned, I think two years before something like that, and was suddenly appearing at feminist conferences, having never published in feminist philosophy, you know, and, it, and philosophy is a discipline where there aren't that many women to start with. So it's a sort of magical effect. Yes. <laughs> as it were. Trans women seem to some people much more interesting than the boring old women that you might have had on the shortlist or at the conference or as a speaker or whatever. So um, that's just my little joke about that. <laughs> yes, it's a good joke. <laughs> um, and you, you talk about three, three pages of questions we don't know enough about mm -hmm. um, in the, your last chapter. It's mm -hmm. quite concerning really, isn't it? The, the, I think because of the repression of academic uh, inquiry, there's three pages of, of things that we don't know enough about. How are well, we going to find out? Well, that's a good question. I mean, this bears on something which I haven't mentioned so far, which is so captured is academia on the whole um, that we are losing the capacity to get data that sex disaggregated because more and more surveys and studies 
will ask for your gender identity and not your sex or they'll ask for your sex, but mean gender identity, or they'll just do it in this incredibly confusing way where you're, the options are sort of like female, male, non-binary, trans-masculine, trans-feminine, prefer not to say, <laughs> or something, yeah. you know? And it's just um, devastating, really, that we will not be able to make the kinds of um, studies of particular demographics young women in particular age groups or particular ge geographical mm. locations, for instance, because we won't have the data. But we also don't really know how many trans people there are because we can't, in order to know how many trans people there were, uh, there were you would have to know sex um, and you'd have to cross refer with gender identity or something like that. Yeah. But we yeah. don't have that either. And in the census, which just happened, there was this huge fight by feminists um, on my side, as it were, um, just to get the English Census Authority to stipulate that sex meant legal sex. What they wanted to do was say sex means gender identity, but they got talked down into sex means legal sex, but legal sex isn't sex. <laughs> legal sex is just what it says in your birth certificate, and that could have been changed through a gender recognition certificate. So we we're just losing data and we, the, we're also dependent, overly dependent on organizations like Stonewall to provide the data. So they do these surveys which are not um, randomly sampled, they're not, uh, you know, they don't meet the gold standard of data collection, yeah. they're kind of snowball sampled from relatively small numbers and they're not disaggregated quite often between the L, G, B, G and the B and the T, but yet wild claims are made on behalf of whichever group they want to make a claim about at the time so it's just a mess it's a mess so we we need to um, know we need some yeah. data and um, david barnsdale has got a question for you um david do you want to ask it do you want to unmute are you with us david hi um in in the final section of your book um you're talking about more data less theory but given that um, uh, queer theory has become so entrenched, it's become kind of a dogma mm. that we need a bit of philosophical theory to refute it. <laughs> well, yeah, and I wouldn't deny that because that's exactly what I think I've done. And actually, mm. I think my role now moving forward is I see myself as, I mean, this is a little bit hyperbolized, but I see myself, my role is to kind of just combat the crap. <laughs> That's coming out of other, <laughs> other, by other theoreticians, but in an ideal world, I think grassroots feminism, this is my point, would not be top down. I mean, obviously it wouldn't be, it'd be grassroots, but you know, we, we need to talk politically, we need the experiences of ordinary women who haven't got some, you know, new sexy idea that gender identity <laughs> uh, changes your state that was never coming out of the grassroots. That was coming out of elite, you know, middle-class academics like me. <laughs> um, That's the, isn't it a grassroots? It's astroturf. Yeah, well, it's been also been uh, funded yeah. quite heavily. Uh, in, yeah, but um, yes, yeah, so I agree with you. I concede that as long as there are other daft theoreticians being listened to, uh, then there is a role for other more sensible theoreticians to correct, but I would, ideally like feminists to stop listening to academics except if they're social scientists and they're, uh -huh. producing, and they're producing data yeah I mean, most people know what you know forget all this you know what a woman a man is <laughs> you didn't need me to write a book to tell you <laughs> uh, but to, to have the categories laid out in such a way i think that really is really helpful for us um as so here's a question which i think is not entirely uh, serious juliet says i wonder if some academics just got bored with reality and thought they'd just start making things up. <laughs> Were they ever in touch with reality is the question. Who knows? Oh, that's cutting. I mean, it's very striking though, isn't it? That um, academics are, are, some academics in gender studies departments are arguing for putting male rapists in prison, in female prisons, sorry. <laughs> um, you know, they will never have to face the consequences of these oh. posturings. So. I don't, you know, they have lost touch with reality, but it won't be them that suffers. Indeed. Um, another question, uh, there's 
uh, I'm going from the uh, the chat here. Um, Di Y has got a question followed by Nigel Scott. Di Y, do you want to ask your question, please? How does trans movement coexist? Oh yeah, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. Oh yeah, so uh, I know there's this like non-binary gender non-conformity thing, which means you're not your gender. So how does this coexist with trans, meaning that you have to change your biology to act a certain way? Aren't those like logically contradicting ideologies? So should we instead be sort of like rallying, again, rallying behind non-binary and non-conformity kind mm -hmm. of uh, section of, of the movement instead of focusing on, on the trans. Yeah, that's a really interesting um, question. I think you're absolutely right that the non, the sort of um, emphasis on non-binary people um, comes from a different part of trans activism intellectually than the focus on essentializing your inner gender. Um, and it comes it comes more from a kind of queer theory background way where things are conceived of as fluid and in a way it's a political act to um, remove yourself from the fixed binary of masculinity and femininity and be something in between. And of course I've got no problem whatsoever and I do say this I say that you know feminists are also interested, a lot of feminists are also interested in um, escaping the gender binary in that sense of masculinity and femininity. Um, but yes. the, the, the way it's all got sort of squashed together in practice means that there are non-binary, you know, non-binary teenagers cutting their breasts off. So actually there's a medicalizing going on uh, of non-binary girls as well, which shouldn't be happening. Um, that is so so yeah and nothing about this is really that logical that's the other thing a lot of this has internal contradictions because the point is not really about truth okay um nigel i think you should I... probably mute yourself yes yeah. <laughs> yeah nigel do you want to ask your question about the religion hello can you hear me yes uh, yes thanks um yeah i don't have a gender identity because i believe that my brain and my body were formed together and they're inextricably connected. Um, but in our organisation, the Liberal Democrats, and of course, across a lot of companies and uh, other organisations, we're being expected to accept that gender identity is a thing uh, in the same way that once upon a time we were expected to accept that we were all Christian and we were, we were all members of the Roman Catholic Church. And if we didn't go along with it, we'd be excommunicated. Now, why should we have to believe somebody else's uh, gender identity theory? And why, why should it be um, we, I can accept they believe it, just as I can believe that some people like the Pope, but I'm not going to do it, and I don't see why I should be compelled to. That's fine by me. I mean, I, I think the parallels of religion are very clear, not just in um, the sort of dualism uh, of identity coming away from the body, which reminds you of the sort of soul um, body distinction in Christianity, but also in terms of the idea of these priests who hold the sacred truths, the idea of deference to holy texts, like we're not supposed to argue, I'm not supposed to have written this book, I'm supposed to have just read the literature and accepted, you know, that wiser people than me understand these things. There's also all the holy days like Pride Week, Pride Month and Transgender Day of Remembrance and things like that. There's the, you know, you could go on forever, basically. Sacramental robes, <laughs> rainbow lanyards. <laughs> I think it's really interesting. But I have no um, disagreement with you that we should not be being compelled to accept it. And in many organisations and universities, we are. So I, I share your discomfort. Uh, does does the force data um, appeal result? Does that has that made a difference to your situation in your university? Well, not noticeably. I mean, no one's. I don't think it's. I've seen reference to it in any <laughs> any communication from my university. It just wouldn't happen. Um, but theoretically, academic freedom is something protected differently from 
um, other people's freedom of speech, as I understand it. So um, we're supposed to have enhanced protections. Um, so I think, as I understand it, the Vorstatter judgment is most significant for people who don't have those enhanced protections. Whether we actually have those protections in practice as academics is a separate question. Um, but I think generally speaking, it's certainly given us some, all some confidence that we cannot be fired for saying the sorts of things that I've been saying. Prior to that, you know, I felt like people might be fired for just reading out bits of my book. <laughs> so um, that's a relief. Um, can I supplementary? Do you uh, do you see comparisons with the way trans uh, hardline trans people treat their members and uh, religious cults? I'm afraid I do. I mean, they're not hard to find. I was listening to this um, documentary about cults, and they said that one of the sort of key indicators of whether it's a cult or not, apart from all the things, you know, deference to authority insistence on deference authority is is describing anyone who disagrees with you as having hatred in their heart or something like you know they are haters they are um bad people who want to hurt you sort of thing and that's exactly what is happening here um the toxicity around trying to critically discuss these ideas which are philosophical ideas that have massive ramifications when enacted in policy and yet we're just not supposed to talk about them or it automatically makes us transphobic that's very cult-like thank you uh, sally power's got a question i think about the sociological dimensions of this sally yeah Oops. hi thanks thanks very much um it's been really interesting i'm from cardiff <laughs> university which as you may know we had a bit of a flurry about this yeah I um, we, asked, we asked the university to reconsider its relationship with stonewall uh, and most of us who did so were social scientists who used demographic data. Uh, but that aside, what, what I'm interested in is the parallels with race and ethnicity. Mm -hmm. Because it seems to me we know, we accept that the precise classifications of race and ethnicity are socially constructed, but they have a biological basis. But if you remember a few years ago, there was a professor in the US who was outed for not really being black, even though she self-identified. And I think to some extent, quite, quite rightly, members of the black community argued that she couldn't be black because she hadn't grown up in a society with a leg legacy of slavery and racism. Mm -hmm. So you can't just change your ethnicity at, well, at will because you're socialized into particular, and, you, and you're treated in particular ways. And it seems to me the same things, whatever the biological basis, the same mm -hmm. things must relate about socialization in relation to gender, oh, sorry, in relation to sex. Well, I mean, yes, I, so my, the argument I make in the book is not for a social, not for womanhood understood as a social category. I just don't think that really makes sense either. And I try and explain why. Having said that, there are plenty of people that think that womanhood and manhood are social categories. Um, and if you think that, then it makes no sense at all that your identity could just simply determine the social perception of you by fiat. It just couldn't, that's not how social perception works, unfortunately. <laughs> you can't just make people see you the way you want to see them. And yeah, if you understand, so I do, I do spell this out too, that if you understand the, the social role that's supposed to be attached to womanhood on these views in a rich sense, then it's going to include growing up as a girl, having certain kinds of experiences, being inculcated into the feminine world in the way that de Beauvoir talks about and none of that happened, you know, you don't get any of that by putting on a dress, <laughs> to put it <laughs> frankly. No, it's really it's interesting that a lot known, of the people, so... and a lot of people arguing about this, who we've had arguments within our department, are, are sociologists, but they kind of downplay the sociological dimension of some of the arguments they're making. I think there's a lot of confused thinking around this. Part of it is because this word gender just does all these different things or is expected to do all these different things which are precisely different. I just also think that there's this overwhelming urge to go along with it, partly for because you want to be kind, partly because you're now frightened if you don't, <laughs> um, which means that the connections, the logical connections 
or disconnections between all these different narratives that have already been pointed out actually in questions and just being glossed over. So there is a, a detriment ac academically. Our brains, we're lo losing brain cells, <laughs> basically. <laughs> I, I find a lot of the inconsistencies here are not hard to find, but it just takes <laughs> um, a certain amount of will to articulate them, given the disapproval that immediately comes down on you. Yeah, and you, you, need, a, you need a climate where you can talk about them and that we just don't have that even in universities. No, I know. It's terrible. <laughs> so it's nice to hear that there's some resistance at Cardiff. Um, Anne, Anne's got a question about uh, gender nonconformity and playing with ideas of gender. Do you want to voice it, Anne? Hi. I mean, it wasn't really a question so much as a, as a comment, really, that um, kind of in my experience, um, kind of growing up and um, being gender non-conforming is, is quite a normal experience to go through. And I think I was kind of, at, at the time I was typing, it's when you were talking about kind of comorbidities. And, and I, and I don't, don't think we need to pathologize that, um, mm. that, that experience. And, and as it turned out, I grew up to be same sex attracted and autistic, but I didn't know those things then. And I think that experience for people like me is actually very typical. And um, yeah. And the danger is if, if we're um, kind of medicalizing that and pathologizing that, then it doesn't allow people to kind of go through those experiences of exploring, which is just quite natural and normal. I agree with you. And um, I don't want to pathologize gender nonconformity either. I would say I would say sex nonconformity just to get rid of this word gender, but, you know, nonconformity with sort of stereotypes around your sex. Um, I'm was and am sex nonconforming and I when I said comorbidities or when we discussed that, I think, you know, within the big spectrum <laughs> of um, adolescents who are sex non-conforming, there are some for whom it becomes a, a, a problem for themselves. And, you know, and then there are others probably who don't belong in the gender identity clinics at all. So I think, you know, I do think that there's actually some harm being done by making this automatically a, an issue that must be sent off to a gender identity clinic yes i agree i agree but we need to talk about all of it you know um sorry you're a mute alison jackie Stoyle, your question about st about stonewall It wasn't really a question. I, I just felt that uh, uh, an observation that organisations, um, you know, it, I, I thought it's quite brave recently for the Equality, the Equality Commission who said they weren't going to um, join up to them anymore, because I think other uh, organisations who perhaps have reservations will not want to be publicly shamed um, and, and be across the newspapers for saying, well, we, we don't agree with this. So I think there's a little bit of, um, I don't know how the ball started rolling. And it seemed to roll really early on because I was teaching in prison when we had the first trans woman come into the women's hall. And um, what I found was interesting and strange um, and very unusual. I'd been working as a teacher for 12 years in prisons. They um, made such a, a big deal. We've had disabled, we had disabled prisoners come into the prison, had no special, um, you know, uh, uh, things done for them. Whereas the trans woman um, came from uh, a male prison, had three visits into the women's area, was allowed to put makeup on and a wig in the car and all of this stuff. But the thing that um, troubled me was, and I think troubles a lot of people, is, and I know people listening will um, totally probably understand as well, women in prison are very different from men in prison. They have often had far more crimes committed against them than they've ever committed. They're probably amongst the most vulnerable women that we have in society. And the trans woman who was coming was a convicted um, murderer, a lifer, so violent and uh, sexually deviant. I don't mean sexually deviant because she was a trans woman. I mean that um, there were things in, in her history against children, against women, 
um, and and uh, against a rent, she actually killed um, uh, a rent boy. So, you know, it's not really the sort of person that you in any other situation would have put into, um, a, a, into a women's hall. And it was just the effort that was made. It's as if, you know, up above, they were told, you need to make this work. And that, um, well, you know, yeah. who's, who's, who's forcing that issue there? Why were they not saying, hang on a minute, why? You know, that's, that's what I was saying, really. I, I mean, that's a very powerful testimony, um, which makes my blood boil. I find it, I actually become a bit inarticulate when I hear things like that. I just can't understand. Do people, you know, do people care so little for mm. women? They really, and these are the, as you say, they've got a high proportion of brain injuries, past emotional abuse, a lot high, high proportion of the normal homeless when they enter just um, outrageous. And I was talking to a prison governor a couple of days ago who shares these concerns. And, and I said, well, where are they housed when they arrive? Um, would they share showers? You know, is it just a kind of myth that they share showers? And she said, well, in some of the modern prisons, there'll be single lot, in a single, what do you call them? I don't know, um, cubicle, single cubicle sort of separate cubicle showers but in some there'll be multi stores and they'll always be openable because you can't lock them and there's gyms that they share and there's changing areas that they share so there's a whole we shouldn't imagine that it's not as bad as we think <laughs> and, and um yeah it's it's a whole different order of crime and it's a male body yep the yeah. other the other thing Absolutely. The other thing uh, as well about women's regimes on the whole is that in some way, the fact that they're extremely vulnerable is recognised. So they spend um, less time locked up. And so there's uh, sometimes where the, the women can, can sort of have their, their unlocked and they can wander about the hall. But also that means that a male bodied, you know, trans woman can go into their cell. So there's opportunities for them to be harassed or bullied by a male bodied person. And for a lot of women in prison, they've received violence from men. So even if the trans woman isn't necessarily being um, violent at that point, the fact that they're in an enclosed space, in perhaps in their own cell, and there's a, a male body person in there who they know is potentially violent, who would frighten us if we were in there without maybe having their experience of trauma. Um, I'd be terrified if, if that particular trans woman came into my cell. Plus, in our, our prison, the, there were curtains separating the showers, so you can't even relax if you're having a bath or something like that or, or whatever. I just feel, yeah, it, it, um, it, it was wrong, totally yeah. and utterly wrong well, I agree and unnecessary. That. We could have a separate, we could have a separate wing or prison or whatever. And they do where trans as well. People, I yes. mean, there is a yeah. separate wing, but it's still not automatic that you get sent there. So, I, I mean, a wider question, I absolutely agree with everything you've said, and I hope people listening understand that even if you want to make accommodations in other areas, this is not an area that we should be making accommodations, and we're doing it, you know, it's utterly, utterly cynical to make women in prison suffer <laughs> as a result of experiments that make us feel virtuous. It's just utterly wrong. But um, the wider question is why nobody cares about women, <laughs> and particularly these women. Mm -hmm. you know. mm -hmm. Yeah, Th thanks, Jackie. Uh, Judith uh, Bailey, you've got a question about uh, uh, sex being a social concept and gender identity being real. How do people deal with the fact that throughout all ages and all societies, the sexes that are larger, stronger and more aggressive have subordinated the smaller, weaker sex? Do you want to ask your question that's at the end of that paragraph? That's it, really. Um, you know, having, having been a feminist all my life, never having to had to sort of go that much deeper, 
um, when I came across the fact that there was an argument between um, whether sex was relevant to women's oppression, uh, it just sort of came to me as a revelation that, of course, if you do look at the way that you know people have developed through all ages, mm. and if you look anywhere in the world, um, you know the, the ones who can beat us up subordinate the ones who have to be nice to them because if we're not, they will beat us up. And I don't see how the people who say that gender is what's relevant and not sex can possibly get around the fact that sex is patently the reason why women are oppressed. I mean, I, I agree with you um, that, well, I mean, there's a bit, there's part of the, the chapter on why sex matters is about the difference that, that size and strength and aggression makes to the heterosexual world. Because it's, you know, same sex relationships, you could be, you know, physically matched with your partner, but in a heterosexual relationship, you're very likely to be, a, there's very likely to be a mismatch just because of genetics. You know, not always, and I'm six foot tall, still I've got absolutely no upper body strength compared to the average five foot five man <laughs> you know so there's there's a whole range of differences predictably with some exceptions and um I think actually to be honest it's partly certain branches of feminism's I wouldn't say fault but you know they haven't helped by really making everything seem um up for change socially and you know culturally constructed and all the rest of it and underplaying our vulnerability as a sex which is not a comfortable fact that any woman really wants to reflect on but we do know it every time we go out the door at 11 o'clock at night you know it's just a fact that we know that if we're walking down a street we could be overpowered and girls know that my students know that you know they talk we talk about it in feminist philosophy every woman knows that and a lot of men are unaware that women know that. They've never even thought about it. Because for them, it's just not automatic that when they walk down the street, they will be relatively weak compared to a whole other subsection. So it's, it's, it's crucial. We can't avoid it. We, might not, be able to, we not, might not like it, but it's a fact. It's the way our biology made us. Yeah. I mean, it seemed to me that it was not just to do with individual relationships, that the man in the relationship is, has more power, but just that, in society, it has always been the men who took over making the decisions. All the churches, all the all the religions, uh, all the policy making institutions um, have been controlled, basically dominated exclusively by men, and they make the rules for how women are supposed to live and how our lives are supposed to be. And I think when we, we got to the point where we were arguing otherwise, it was because just because we're weaker doesn't mean we're dimmer or less capable of making decisions and that sort of thing. So you're fighting back against that view of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, determination. But actually, in terms of social terms and why we are where we are, is you know, in societies, it's patently they're bigger and stronger than we are. I think that's obviously had a role to play in the way that our societies are structured. I'm not denying that at all. I mean, you can get what you want by um, being bigger and stronger. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, do, I mean, I think that things are more complicated now in terms of the way that our society is structured is not really structured around strength in um, lots of workplaces and lots of career jobs. You know, the, all the computing age and technology and has complicated that story. I'm not saying it didn't start that way and I'm not saying it's not still that way in some areas. I'm not really disagreeing with you that I just don't think the story is quite as clean. No, my point is, is that it's determined history. If we look back, all the rules have been made, for example, by the religions who have always been men by um, lawmakers who have always been men and so on. And we now accept this is where we are. Mm -hmm. And women are fighting to break out of some of those, those constructs. But the constructs have been made by men because they were able to do it, because if we didn't agree with them, they could beat us up. There's, there's a, a, a note here that you've just been mentioned by Joanna Cherry in Parliament, uh, Kathleen, um, talking about the uh, higher education bill. Um, do you want to <laughs> make a comment about <laughs> well, I didn't know that was going to happen, obviously. The freedom of speech bill, you know. Um, so that's going through its second reading. So, yeah, there's a um, government have brought um, as a proposal into legislation, should it pass through the various stages, um, a bill which will provide extra, if it works, will provide extra protections for academics and for academic free speech. Um, so there's a lot of controversy around this bill because 
lots of academics don't think there's a problem at all and they also think that that's a the problem such as it is is being weaponized by the right wing um it's a culture war etc and um universities really obviously don't want a layer of bureaucracy are worried about um intervention government intervention in their business which you know normally i would i think be quite sympathetic to except that i have seen how universities seem completely unable to deal with protecting academic free speech around criticism of gender identity and i've seen that firsthand and i've seen that through multiple multiple testimonies of academics um, to whom i've talked uh, anonymous testimonies when i've sought them and um, just incident after incident after incident of complaints, student complaints, which are then escalated into formal complaints that go on for months or um, corridor conversations saying, you can't say that if you want a promotion or no platforming, in my case, deplatforming a couple of times, um, protests uh, against you, defamation by colleagues online, serious defamation by academic colleagues online of you, your motives, your character, your personality, your intellect, uh, the fact you're a danger to trans students because you hold these views and so on. So um, universities just refuse to see it as far as I can see, because they they have customers, student customers who believe a lot of this stuff. And that is the fundamental problem, um, that it's also a trend in the younger generation at the moment to believe all this stuff and to be activist about it. So they don't want to get on the wrong side of their customers or their future <laughs> customers. And they see people like me as an embarrassment to their brand. And they see Stonewall as an enhancement of their brand. So this is the dynamic. And I think something's just got to be done because these questions are too important not for, you know, to stop academics talking about um, and getting data in about sex and so on. So um, that's where I stand on that. You think that uh, when the case of uh, Alison Bailey is heard next year, that, that's, that what comes out then about Stonewall's machinations will have an effect? I don't know, do I? I mean, I haven't seen, um, I'm not prior to any special information that's not in the public domain about that, but it looks like Stonewall intervened um, threateningly uh, with Alison's employer. She's a black lesbian who has expressed, you know, the sorts of doubts that I have about gender identity and it's fed particularly on young lesbians. Um, and she should, she's a barrister. She, I mean, just as an ordinary citizen, she should have the right to be able to say what she thinks about this as we all should. So um, it's shocking if, if, if the allegations are true there, um, I don't know. I don't want to say anything that would ruin her case, but you know, I think there's big <laughs> questions to be asked about Stonewall and their overstepping of their remit. Yes. Yes. Thank you. And um, Pete Whitelock, you had a question about uh, gender recognition. Uh, should it be uh, revoked if you uh, commit a sexual crime? Is Pete? that my? Oh, sorry. Do you want to ask your question? Uh, yeah, I was just <clears throat> I was just thinking that um, because we've got this uh, legal uh, fiction of uh, <clears throat> of the Gender Recognition Act, um, but it does depend on you demonstrating that you don't have any particular um, paraphilias that might might be dangerous in the context of uh, being treated as a woman. So why, why are we in the situation where um, a convicted rapist can be put in the woman's estate? Um, should there not be uh, a notion of, of, of revoking a gender recognition certificate if, um, if somebody's convicted of, of, of a, a violent crime? I mean, I, it's not actually one I've thought about, 
and because I haven't thought about it I'm quite wary of just saying yes that sounds great <laughs> because people sure. tend to take what I say quite seriously and then and my critics certainly take it seriously but I guess what I think is that I would honestly my priority would be clarifying the Equality Act so that it's not just like males generally <laughs> um, as far as possible without becoming illiberal and intrusive you know there's a strong norm that they do not enter female spaces where women sleep or undress or are vulnerable in that way and that you know that's if that was so they absolutely shouldn't be in prisons absolutely should not be in prisons but they also shouldn't be males should not be in female changing rooms <laughs> i just don't think that that didn't used to be controversial so um we that means we need to look at provision for trans women and trans men because they they also have needs that we haven't even mentioned um so there's a serious structural issue here i don't want to make it sound simple because i don't think it is but that would be my area of concern primarily um but so because you've got this you've got this this sort of legal fiction that says yeah, <clears throat> once you've got your grc mm -hmm. you're a woman mm -hmm. <clears throat> That's that's the problem, isn't it? No, I don't. Doesn't it? Wouldn't be a problem if all of the other stuff was clarified. Like if it was, if the Equality Act did its job properly and pointed out that there are perfect, there are a number of exemptions, which you know mean that trans women do not get entry into these spaces or these resources or these sports teams and so on because the resources are there in the Equality Act, but it's the interaction of the wording of the Equality Act and the Gender Recognition Act is very unclear. And there is this reluctance to actually make it the norm um, that the exemptions apply. So, yeah, I, I totally I agree with you. I mean, I prefer, we... I think it, we should say, I've been saying a long time, it's not a character test for men <laughs> um, to <laughs> say that you can't enter female status. It's not, it's not personal. And for that similar sort of reason, I would be wary of getting into revoking a gender recognition certificate on the basis of some kind of character test. I mean, it's just shouldn't the two things. But it, it's not a it's not a character test. It's a legal judgment. And already to get a gender and recognition certificate, you have to you have mm -hmm. to pass the um, the requirements that you don't have a particular paraphilia. Um, mm -hmm. I so I mean, isn't that, well. isn't that putting it on, I mean, I agree with you. Yeah. You know, across the board, but the point is that the judgment of last week showed that the gender recognition mm. act is actually, is actually being taken overly seriously by, mm -hmm. by, by the legal establishment. And they are saying, okay, you are a woman, you're in a woman's prison. I think, I mean, I'm not I'm not ruling what you're saying out of hand. I'll just have to I'd have to think more about it. I also find um, I know that you got me in from here for my opinions, but I I think part of the sort of chilling effect of, of what we've just been talking about is that so few people are talking about this, that it puts quite a lot of onus on people like me to have solutions. Whereas, know. you know, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a judge and I'm not a prison officer. I, I know so I would, you know, the ideal universe. Yeah, you, you're, doing, you're doing your job as a philosopher, I mean, and that's what's needed. I just want to say, though, that I think there should be consideration of all these options by people with, you know, expertise. That's Can I ask you the thing? No, Pete, you can't. I'm sorry. <laughs> we've got, we haven't got much long, much longer. But we've got a question from <laughs> Eleanor Van de Graaff. No, okay. sorry. Um, mm -hmm. Eleanor's got a question about uh, the GRA. Can we go back to the critique of the position? about the legal concept. We don't have the legal concept of gender. We shouldn't have GRA. Can we go back to that, please? Uh, have I summed that up, Eleanor? Yeah, thank you very much. No, it's, uh, I think it's been touched upon uh, already quite in depth, but um, to me, it doesn't make sense that we have the GRA in its current form, um, precisely because of the um, um, legal concept of gender is not properly defined. And if we're talking about sex, this document um, is really conflating a lot of uh, and causing a lot of confusion in the current um, circumstances. So I, just my I comment. I agree with you that it should be redrafted, I think. I'm not, I mean, there's, there's big discussion going on, I think, 
on my side of the fence about what the role the Gender Recognition Act plays and what it should play. And I've been, um, my view for what it's worth is that I don't think, uh, you know, I'm trying to take a pragmatic solution. Lots of people have gender recognition certificates and they're personally meaningful for them. And I just don't see what point is in trying to go backwards. We have it, but we should clarify it and we should clarify that it does not give you automatic um, rights of entry into spaces and resources and sports teams and all the other, there's lots and lots and lots of exemptions that it, and we should clarify what those exemptions are and we should make them the norm rather than something you have to specially apply for to, to use. Um, so there should be a, a different understanding of what a gender recognition certificate does. And, the, and I agree the judiciary seem many members of the judiciary and the legal profession generally seem completely confused and the wording is confused and the wording in of the Equality Act is confused. I mean, this word gender is just a minefield. Yes, and um, Jenny, you. Jenny Voice, uh, uh, you've got a question for us about schools relying on Stonewall for information. Are you able to ask your question? Jenny Voice. Hello? Jenny. I'll ask the question, with schools reliant on Stonewall for information, how do schools approach gender identity that isn't from an affirmation standpoint? Um, lots of people want the answer to that, and uh, I don't know whether you've got the answer to that. <laughs> um, well, I think we actually had a really valuable suggestion earlier, which is not to pathologise um, sex nonconformity, uh, to treat, to not to not dramatize it. I mean, I mean, maybe that's not what you're specifically asking about, but that can be the baseline, you know, that girls and boys can like whatever they like and whoever they like and wear um, up to a point consistent with uniform norms, whatever they like. I mean, I personally quite like gender neutral uniforms because I do think it um, stops this sort of dramatization of difference early on in kids lives like the girls wear this the boys wear this sort of thing you know at my kids school it's gender neutral now they just all wear trousers and a polo top and there was a big fuss about it but um i quite <laughs> like it <laughs> so that's there's that now the trouble is of course that gender identity is now in the culture it's in the air it's on bbc <laughs> it's on cbb's it's on uh whatever the other one of children's bbc children's programming um so they'll pick it up and then there's books about it and you know do you have a gender identity the gender the penguin who thinks he's a girl or whatever you know <laughs> there's all sorts of books written by trans activists now in schools so they may well get the idea that they're in the wrong body or that you know whatever the story is and um i think probably or i, I mean i'm not a professional Again, we need professionals in this that aren't captured themselves, but, you know, no one should panic. <laughs> Things, you know, childhood and adolescence is a period of identifications, um, some of them very intense. And also as a, as a lesbian, it's worth saying, um, a lot of my friends now um, identified as boys, as children. You know, they used to try and pee standing up. They used to call themselves George and Tom, and they insisted that their parents did so. And this was way before anyone was sent to a clinic for it. The parents just sort of went, okay, <laughs> went along with it for a bit until it stopped. So um, we do to try and get back to that somehow and take the drama and the fear out of it. All the fear mongering about potential for suicide has just got to be taken out. You know, it's, it's, it's not right, it's not true. And it's certainly not helping parents who are frightened. Yeah. Um, one last question I think we've got time for. Is Gina Taylor with us? Do you want to ask your question about the academic prejudice, combating that and getting PhD students to explore sex and gender from a gender critical position? We should get funding first. Gina, yeah. Well, yes, I think that that's a major, um, as you know, there's such a restriction on academic freedom to actually um, to talk about things that 
there's no such thing as women's studies anymore. It is all gender studies. The, many students are taught um, that that the ideology that you're um, speaking against is the is the only ideology. That is all they know. There are people who are able to criticise that, but they're not going to get academic tenure. They're not going to get a position in order to provide um, that position as as education. Um, nobody, you yeah. know, people are people are afraid of 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 speaking out, but no one's going to fund it. If you if if you, no. if you are the pariah of your academic organisation, then um, then how is how is a new generation going to come yeah, up? Yeah, I know. I mean, they they have these, they have all these ideologies. Any, well, many of them have these ideologies, mm. but there's not going to be anything to contradict it that has any status academically. And being as how they're educated within a system that frequently doesn't get them to think for themselves and just teaches them what they need to learn for exams and. There are there is there's, there's just far less questioning and there is going to be far less material in an academic context for them to use to question and form I, their own I, opinions. I think you're right about certainly about as far as I can see the discipline of gender studies with some honourable exceptions it's taught like um, like we're at church basically and students are not encouraged to critically scrutinise the material they've been given unless it's mine <laughs> and then there's a sort of ten minute hate or whatever. But um, but not but gender studies is not the whole of a university. So I think there is hope, right? So my discipline, philosophy, feminist philosophy is being captured to some extent, but there's still philosophy that isn't feminist, badged as feminist, where there's a strong tradition of absolutely critically engaging with material, questioning yourself, questioning each other, getting students to question you, you encourage them to disagree with you in their essays. That's still happening. Um, and I think the funding question is slightly different because unfortunately the people deciding the funding are probably from if it's in this area it will they will probably be from gender studies so that's a problem i can't solve we need donations from people that want to fund phds we've got some brilliant students I think what, the, last, money. The, last, the last point of my question was can jk rowling not not establish <laughs> like kind of everything. phd um, well somebody study. should i mean we need some money yeah that's badged for this work and then mm. it will happen because there's some great students there that would do it and there's people that would supervise. We also need academics to be braver. And I know it's hard, but we certainly, we specifically need professors to be braver because it's unreasonable to expect younger, untenured people or people with promotions ahead of them or young families to support. And there's redundancy in the air in lots of institutions. It's unreasonable to expect them to bear the burden, but professors, we have this academic freedom. It's about to be enhanced. It's uncomfortable. It's horrible. It's, you know, it puts you, it challenges you psychologically. And but you're doing a good thing by holding a space for students and faculty to be able to question. So it's not going to change unless we do it and take some responsibility for doing that. I think. And as an, it's another point, if there is time for me to say about. Um, government departments, I mean, in, in the way that government departments have um, withdrawn their uh, sign up to the Stonewall um, diversity scheme, mm. um, is, is, that a, is that the start of something? Do you think that will um, pass on to academic institutions to say, um, hang on a minute, let's question some of this? Well, some of it's happened. No, I mean, so, some, some government departments have withdrawn, others stay. I think that's a result of the tour some of the some Tories um, deciding it's strategic to withdraw. Now, so if we keep a Tory government, um, I think there'll be increasing numbers of checks on Stonewall's powers within certain areas will come into play. If we get a Labour government or <laughs> a Lib Dem <laughs> government <laughs> or some kind of amalgam, um, I think we might be screwed again, to be honest. <laughs> so I think there's no other political party apart from the Tories apparently recognizing some of those dangers. Mm. That's bad news for me. I'm not a Tory voter, but what are the Lib Dems doing <laughs> about this? You know, this this is an issue for political parties because um, this is a you know this is a political issue, and uh, Stonewall will give us 
take as much rope as you give them, as it were. I don't know, my metaphors are getting a bit confused now, but yeah. Okay. Um, I think that's probably all the questions we've got time for tonight. I'm sorry to say this. I'm hoping that we can we can save the chat because there's some absolutely wonderful points been raised yeah. uh, tonight and it's been a really fruitful discussion of your book. And yeah, the thank you. Thank you so much. Underlying it. Thanks for um, all your brilliant questions. Well, I'd like to thank you uh, particularly for uh, for coming along and, and opening yourself up to being questioned. <laughs> I put on the spot about some issues which, frankly, you haven't had time to consider before. <laughs>